because I often share that, and I'll do this quickly, but in the Old Testament, if you want to live by the law, you have to keep it all. In fact, it says if you break one, you've broken them all. And if you keep them all, you have 15 verses of blessings in Deuteronomy 28. If you break the law, well, even one of the law, you're guilty of all, and you have about 60 verses of cursing that comes on your life. Now that's what Christians have been living under for all these 2,000 years. They've been taught to live by a knowledge of good and evil which produces that concept of blessing and cursing. The law was never written for a spiritual man. The law was written on the outside for people in that age, 2,000 years ago, man had not nearly evolved in his consciousness as he is today. And man was given the law on the outside of him to control the flesh nature. Amen. And I do believe that there was a day when man did have to have that law written there on the outside. But it was never intended to be because when Moses came down off the mountain with the second... Uh, law that was written, it was put in the ark. And the ark we know represents Christ. It simply means Christ, the law, is a law of life, not a law of letters. And in the new covenant, you don't need a man to teach you. And in the new covenant, there is no, in, in the New Testament, there is no uh, principle whatsoever of any kind of a church that we see manifested today in this religious system out here. Now there are a few places that are really good to go to, but the majority of the churches that you go to will strictly teach you a performance-based religion to make you more acceptable, not only in your own eyes, but before God. But true spiritual warfare is to possess this land. And all of the nations in the Old Testament represent, there's, there's at least seven, those seven nations are all in here. Yes. Now, where, where we missed it, and it really hasn't been our fault, is we get into these religious teachings, and they try to teach you how to overcome. And I use the example a lot about if you take a seed, you know that in the seed is everything the seed needs to reproduce the seed kingdom, whether it's a corn or flower, whatever it is. Well, what religion does is take the seed and try to teach it what it's supposed to do and what it's supposed to look like, rather than plant it in good soil and nourish it and water it and just let it naturally grow. Amen. So that's what we need. We don't really need to be taught how to be a Christian because that gets us into the workings of the flesh. What we need is proper teaching and nourishing that will nourish the seed in us to cause it to grow, to break the shell of this outer man so that this outer man does fall into the ground and die, but it's not by any self-effort whatsoever. It's simply by the natural process of the seed being ministered to, watered, and it grows. Zechariah 12.1 says that the Lord stretched forth the heavens, he laid the foundations of the earth, and he formed the spirit in man. That was our beginnings. It, it, it was our beginnings as a physical being in Genesis chapter 2. The Lord literally formed the spirit in man. Well, in Genesis it says it this way, that God placed man in a garden. It's the same thing. Because we are God's garden. That's what the Song of Solomon is all about. Is God coming to his garden and God wooing us by his spirit. And God causing us to fall deeply in love with his spirit. Not out here, but in here. Uh, it's, it's so strange when people first hear about falling in love with themselves. It is. It's a strange concept. But I'll tell you what, until you do you will never be able to love anybody else. Until we experience that magnificent love of God coming up and forth within us, 
That's the only way the spirit and the soul can be reunited is by the soulish part of you falling in love with your spirit. And realizing that everything that God is, all of His beauty and all of His attributes and all of His compassion, all of the wondrous miracle working power, everything that God is, is in us. But as this has been sharing a seed, So we overcome, first of all, by learning how to fellowship, not with the God in the heavens, but with the God within, with the Spirit of God within. I learned many years ago to sit and worship, and as I worshiped, I would sense a stirring within, and, and begin to experience the beauty of the Lord being formed in me. And see, when that happens, that is when you can begin to take the land. And you learn that you overcome not by doing anything at all. You, you discover that being in God's image, you create the same as God creates. And that is by the word, by speaking. And so... I can only use myself as an example because that's all I've experienced in my own life and my own what I've went through. But I mentioned the other night about I was an angry man. I, my whole family on my father's side were just angry people. And so I did everything to try to suppress that anger. And I went to church and I would, you know, I was told not, and not only, I had so many things. I was so messed up as a Christian. And I, all I was told is what I needed to do to overcome. I was never told. I, well, I was told in the way the overcomer is in you. But, I mean, that's just, just as an intellectual knowledge doesn't help you at all. But by learning to really <coughs> spend that time in the quiet and with the Spirit of God, I began to realize through that intimate fellowship and relationship that I had with the Father, I began to realize then that the voice of God was not coming out of the heavens outside of me, but the voice of God would have to come from my innermost being. And that's why Lyndon Musgrove wrote a song a while back, that when I speak, all heaven stands to listen. And when I speak, the mountains begin to tremble. And we have so much. In fact, we have everything that we possibly could ever need. And it's all been given to us. And you know what? It's all here. If we would just believe what this says. I was in a meeting a couple, a couple of years ago, or I think last year sometime, I don't remember, but a brother said something that really hit me. He said, you know, we all read the Bible, and we all love Jesus, we just don't do what he says. <laughs> and we don't believe what he says. But the keys to, to take, keep taking possession of this land, the keys are all here. But the problem is we've never been adequately informed on how to interpret this. Because as, as black and white letters and as a literal history book, it can't do anything for you in the present. But if you can just believe, like one of the verses is this, you know, we're so concerned in, when we're still working so much out of a carnal mind, we're so concerned about how we can overcome and what we can do to overcome. In uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 9 says this. Now remember, we were created in Genesis chapter 1 as a spiritual being. And for those of you who haven't heard this, I'd like to share this. The word created there in Genesis does not mean to create something out of nothing. If you look up in your stones, you'll see the word created also means to be cut down. So we were literally chips off the old block. <coughs> so to speak, that we were, we are all can't come out of that one essence of God, who God is and what God is. 